Hello and welcome to another episode of STEER by Dr. Amdekar's team. I am Dr. Tushar Manyar, pediatrician from Andheri. And today we will be talking about abnormal movements, discussing whether they could be physiological or pathological and how to approach the same. We all know that abnormal movements are frightening not only for the parents but also scary for the treating physician. We must first and foremost look at the most critical abnormal movement and that is the seizure disorder. Whenever you come across a child who has abnormal movements from history and examination, make sure that the child was able to focus and communicate with the parent at that time or not. In case of generalized seizures, one would expect a loss of, loss of consciousness the child's eyes could be up, there could be an uprolling of the eyeball, but more importantly, the child would have a staring look and the eyes will be open. There can be associated frothing and there may or may not be tonic clonic movements of the limbs. This can occur when the child is awake as well as if the child is asleep. Once you have ruled out this seizure disorder, you must also think and make sure that the Complaints presented to you are not like seizure mimics. Give you an example. You have a young infant who has been complained, whose parents have noticed sudden clenching of teeth and tightening of the hand and the limbs. But the child is looking at the mother is immediately after the episode, which last few moments is able to either feed communicate or smile and play normally, you are most probably looking at shuddering attacks, which are considered one of the seizure mimics. Now, can any abnormal movement be physiological? It sounds like a paradox, but we must know that any ab there are abnormal movements which may not have a pathological background and so we would like to call them physiological. Let me elaborate this by giving you a few examples. A newborn who is jittery and when you are able to restrain the child and while restraining the limb or holding the baby, the jitteriness stops, then you are considering it as a physiological movement. On the other hand, if you have a child who is breathing fast and then his breathing is becoming slow and then again becoming fast. These are rhythmic breathing movements in newborn and you would consider them normal or physiological unless if the child is having in between cessation of breathing or apnea, then that would not be any more considered as physiological. Similarly, a child may have startle reflex, which is normal till six to eight weeks and that is completely physiological. But if it persists beyond six to eight weeks, one should think about any other neurological condition or conditions like cerebral palsy or brain affection. In bigger children, one may have tics which can be considered as suppressible disorder, movement disorder and can be labeled as physiological. But if these tics were to progress and have motor tics associated with vocal tics as well as uncontrolled offensive words being used, you would label them as Tourette syndrome. So we have now talked about seizure disorders. We have now talked about seizure mimics and some physiological movements. There are some non-epileptic paroxysmal events which look like seizures or which may look like a moment disorder. To give you some examples, child with a cyanotic spell or breath holding spasm can appear to have either a seizure or some kind of tonic movement, movement and that has to be differentiated from each other. Similarly, a child with benign paroxysmal vertigo may come and cling the mother and then complain that everything is going round and round. Now, we must be able to identify this as a migraine variant and not label this as an epilepsy. When we look at movement disorders, we try to classify them into bradykinetic movements and hyperkinetic movements. 
bradykinetic movements are relatively uncommon in young children. But in adults and in geriatric population, one would call Parkinson disease as a prototype of bradykinetic disorders. When you are looking at hyperkinetic disorders, conditions like uh, movements like tics, tremors, chorea, dystonia, amebalismus, as well as stereotypies come to our mind. Now we must understand that these could be stand alone disorder, like one could have uh, only tremors as a functional tremor or as a condition with only tics, or there could be a hemifacial dystonia, and that would be without any other neurological or other medical condition. But many a times, a standalone movement disorder could be a harbinger of another for or of progressing that condition into a major brain affection. Again, to give you an example, a child who complains of bad handwriting or worsening handwriting and some loss of motor, fine motor skill may be the first sign or a red flag for a further dystonia and neurological conditions, including hepatic involvement, if the child is getting into a Wilson disease. Standalone movement disorders can sometimes help us localize the lesion. For example, a child with hemispelismus is likely to have a problem in globus pallidus. A child with dystonia could be having a problem from putamen or extrapyramidal tracts. And somebody with chorea could have a localization in caudate nucleus. But what happens is because these basal ganglia are very in, uh, significantly interconnected and anatomically close to each other, one may not always have only isolated single movement disorder and there could be more than one present at the same time. To give you an example, in a child with TB meningitis causing affection of internal capsule, subsequent peripheral edema can present with dystonia as well as hemibelismus. Now, let us look at individual movement disorders. We will give you an overview because detailed discussion is not possible for want of time. Ticks are classically defined as repetitive movements of a group of muscles or vocal ticks, which can be suppressible. On the other hand, tremors are oscillating back and forth movements occurring along the axis of the joint. Dystonia, on the other hand, are co-contraction of agonist and antagonist, and which result in either a particular posturing twisting or sustained contraction of those muscles. Dystonias are usually precipitated by, by voluntary movement. Hemimbalismus, on the other hand, are brief but shock-like intermittent movements with wide flinging action. Chorea, as we all know, are quasi-purposive movements. That means the patient has this abnormal movement which he or she tries to mask by converting them into a normal movement. And finally, we look at stereotypies which are defined as simple repetitive movements which are controllable. For example, repeated, repeated chewing, touching objects, hand wringing movements and rocking movements. These are some of the common stereotypies that we see. And they are commonly seen in children with autism spectrum disorders, Rett syndrome, or some cases of intellectual disabilities. Friends, when we look at all the physiological as well as physiological disorders, one must keep functional disorders as in mind as well, which are also known as conversion disorders. How do we identify them? If we see a disorder which has abrupt onset, very fast progression, has signs and symptoms which are variable over a period of time. There is waxing and waning of symptoms. And more importantly, if there is the constellation of signs and symptoms are incongruous with any known medical condition, if the symptoms improve on distractibility, one should seriously consider 
functional movement disorders. Sometimes you have non-neurological cause of movement disorders like antiemetic related tardive dyskinesia. So we must keep our eye mind open for various options when we are dealing with a, dealing a child with abnormal movements. So friends to summarize, in a child with abnormal movements, first rule out seizure disorders. Consider whether this is seizure mimics or not. If you are thinking of physiological disorders, movement disorder, rule out red flags for the same. Consider paroxysmal non-epileptic movements before you label movement disorders. When you are considering movement disorder, try to see if you can find a lo anatomical localization and decide whether this is a standalone disorder or whether this is getting into a serious medical condition. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. We'll meet once again on one of the STIR lectures. Thank you.